So um, I'm really happy to be here today because uh, I just finished two weeks of, I would call it semi-retreat. It was time for myself. Um, I did a few activities. As uh, some of you know, I was in London last week, uh, almost a whole week ago, for a peace walk, a multi-faith peace walk. And it wasn't a march. It wasn't a protest. You know, we can easily use those words when we see big groups of people on the streets. But this was actually walking meditation, trying to be an embodiment of peace for the people around us. And I do feel that it changed the atmosphere of the city. You could almost hear a hush come over people. And apparently we picked up a fair few people on that walk who hadn't been there from the outset, but were drawn to the energy of the group and to the diversity, especially of the religions that were represented there religions and no religions so it was completely open but it was very moving for me because I was walking with an imam on my right or was it no it was a rabbi on my right and the imam was on my left and then this Buddhist nun between them you know and then there was a druid a little bit further along uh, <laughs> and uh, Quakers and um, Brahma Kumaris and uh, who else Sikhs and other kind of Hindu religions as well. The Brahma Kumaris is a particular um, tradition, Indian based. Oh, there were Zoro Zoroastrians, yeah, and uh, I'm sure there's Jains, that's right, there were Jain people as well. And it was so beautiful to see how people from such diverse backgrounds and seemingly very different religions could effortlessly gather temporarily just for a short time in total peace and harmony you know walking alongside one another without needing to sort of see each other as different or even ask questions we didn't have a lot of time for that but nevertheless there was a unity in terms of what we stand for in terms of the values that we represented and um, everybody gave their prayers and their blessings in my case in the beginning and um you know, it's very, it's a very similar message, just framed in different language with different references, maybe different views, right? I mean, we can't say that every religion is the same. And I think, you know, Buddhism is different in that it's not a, a God-based religion. And um, we tend to take the understanding of non-self that bit further, that bit deeper, because it applies to all aspects of what we take to be a self. It applies to all aspects of existence, you know, even these higher realms, the God realms, the heaven realms, maybe framed in Christian uh, words or, or Hinduism also. Uh, all of that is non-self. So that's the main difference. But essentially, um, how can a religion really be a religion if it doesn't stand for peace? So I thought it was very beautiful. And these were, you know, leaders, representatives of these religions. So you can see that the problems are never caused by those who understand, you know, those who understand what they're doing and what these uh, teachings stand for. So I thought that was a very beautiful representation of metta and of, um, you know, inclusivity and the metta that extends across the seeming so-called boundaries that we uh we put on ourselves, you know, based on labels. I'm a this, I'm not a that, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I thought that was just a nice uh, image, really, to share. And if you can get online and have a look at some of those photos, it's very powerful to see that represented in, uh, in community. So anyway, we also have a little community here. And even though we might all be more... Uh, aligned to the Buddhist perspective, still we'll have our different understandings. Um, but ultimately what matters is the way we can open our hearts to ourselves, to uh, our experiences inside the mind, to uh, whatever emotions are coming up for us in our heart. So metta meditation is not to elicit a particular feeling, although that may come as a result. But metta meditation is to learn to soften, to widen, to make our hearts more resilient, softer, more welcoming, more accepting of life. Yeah. So during my retreat, uh, which is supposed to be ending sort of today, slowly, slowly, um, I was practicing in a very simple way of just combining the metta with the breath 
and imagining that I was breathing in love through the breath and breathing it out with the out breath. And uh, I was also a little bit inspired by um, another bikini whose talk I finally got to hear. Uh, that was Adi, Adi Muti, who gave you a talk uh, during the rains retreat. And she started by really feeling into the chest area. So I thought we'd do that today to warm up this area around the chest. Now, if that feels triggering for anyone, if you're holding some trauma or there's maybe some disease there or you feel tight or shortness of breath, please just expand your awareness. You don't have to follow exactly, you know, to the point. Put your mind wherever it's easy to do so in the beginning. So we'll do a little body scan, but then we'll focus a little bit around the chest and we'll just feel into our breathing and infuse that breath with a sense of being loved, receiving love, and also giving it out. So um, as usual, these are just suggestions. These are just um, invitations for the practice. But if that's not what nourishes you today, then please practice in your own way, however feels most nourishing, most gentle, uh, most resourcing for you. So, and that means you can just stay with that generalized sense of being kind, being aware, you know, to whatever's arousing the body and mind. Okay, so we'll um, start the meditation. We sit usually for about 40 minutes or so. Um, so it's important to really begin by feeling into your body and asking your body how it wants to be seated. Or maybe it wants to be lying down today. Maybe you want to recline. Maybe, I don't usually suggest this, but maybe you even want to stand. Sometimes that can be really good for the body. If you do want to stand, then I do suggest keeping your eyes slightly open and maybe just standing for the first five, ten minutes. But it's good to have these different postures because our body sometimes is not in good health. So however your body feels most comfortable, please feel into that. And we can do this most effectively by gently closing our eyes. Allowing the world of vision of forms to slowly subside. which tends to bring us more in touch with the feeling part of the mind. Vedana. The contact between the body and the mind. So just sensing into your body sitting or reclining, whether on the floor or on a chair. And noticing, first of all, how you've positioned yourself, whether your limbs have enough space to feel at ease, perhaps so that you can wiggle your toes, So your knees are not too tight. See if there's any way you can relieve the pressure on your knees. For example, if you're sitting on a chair, maybe moving your ankles slightly forward so they're not directly under the knees. This helps to even out the distribution of the weight. Your knees spreading it to your ankles and rooting your feet on the floor. If you're sitting cross-legged, see that your knees aren't too tightly bent. And then checking 
whether your weight is evenly distributed between the two buttocks. But there's no clothing, pressing, maybe folded under your buttocks. See if you can release anything that's causing unnecessary strain or pressure. Taking your seat on the earth. And feeling up into the lower back, the hips. Maybe extending very slightly to feel the uprightness, the support of the spine. Noticing your shoulders once the back is a little straighter. Sometimes you realize the shoulders are hunched a little forward and it might feel freeing to just roll them back, give them some movement, allow any crunchiness, any tension to release. Sometimes you can just squeeze them slightly together or up towards your ears and just let them go. How does that feel? And how does that change the position of your hands, your arms? Feeling in all the way down your arms to the fingers and the fingertips, letting them be free. Perhaps feeling the touch of the air on your hands. Temperature, the lightness of the air. Noticing your neck. Checking that the weight of your head is evenly distributed on your neck. Perhaps just gently lengthening the neck along the back. Keeping your head slightly forward perhaps. And all of these movements can be extremely gentle. Even just the thought of it can help gently adjust. And imagining a cord from the top of your head up into the sky. Feeling that space above the head, a sense of lightness at the top of the head. And relaxing the muscles in the face. When the face muscles are relaxed, it sends a message to our brain, to our minds, that it's time to go inside, to loosen that connection with the outside world, any sense of needing to perform. Just softening the eyes, allowing them to float in that cavern that space in the skull. Softening the cheeks, letting them drop. Relaxing the jaw, the lips. Offering yourself personal space seclusion among friends. And just taking a breath, enjoying, feeling the breath. Rise in your belly, fill up your lungs. And release tensions on the out breath, feeling belly form.
Breathing in, noticing that expansion in the chest, in the belly, in the ribs. With the out breath, imagining any tension just draining out into the ground. Perhaps as you breathe in, noticing even the rib cage around the back expand. Allowing the air to fill every little corner of your chest, your rib cage, your belly. Maybe even noticing the area around the back of the waist. Gently expand that. And relax. And allowing the breath to become natural. Letting the body breathe. Now, if you're comfortable to do so, bringing your awareness to the top of the chest, the right side of your chest, just under the collarbone towards your shoulder. Noticing any sensations you experience at the top right of your chest, just receiving those sensations, whatever they may be, remaining open and kind. Allowing the lights of your mind to turn off. Simply by being open, by being present. Spreading your awareness to the top left side of your chest. Just under your collarbone and all the way around towards your shoulder, your armpit. Any sensations you notice. Maybe sensations across the skin. Maybe tingling, warmth. Maybe the touch of your clothing. Maybe sensations more deeply inside. Whatever you notice, just remaining passive, open and kind. Until the whole top of your chest, from the right to the left. Is held in this beautiful kindfulness. Now feeling into the top right of your chest on your back. The other side of your torso. Perhaps if your mindfulness is strong, you can penetrate right through the body, through to the other side. Or just begin on your back. Noticing any sensations below your shoulder, 
towards your spine on the right side of your back. Spreading your awareness to include the left side of your upper chest on the back. Maybe you can even feel the breathing here. Just receiving any sensations that arise. Until the whole top of the chest, front and back, is suffused by kindfulness. Coming back now to the front of your chest on the right, just below the breast. Just feeling any sensations there right the way from the rib cage around to the center of your chest. And spread it into the left side of your lower chest. All the way from the center of the chest right around to the rib cage on the left. And sensing in to the back of the chest again, starting on either side. Feeling any sensations the back of your chest, all the way down to the bottom of the rib cage, and around the sides of the trunk, so that your whole torso, where your breathing apparatus sits, is held in this gentle kindfulness. Noticing the rhythm of your breath. And coming to rest your awareness in the heart area, the center of your chest.
can be a wide area or even a small area, whatever feels restful and pleasant to you. Noticing your breathing. Suffusing that breath, kindness with love. Perhaps if it works for you, imagining that you're breathing in the love of someone who represents compassion, safety, benevolence to you. Or if it comes more easily, just imagining you're in a place that represent those qualities of safety, friendliness of love, <clears throat> or where you felt those feelings before. And notice your in-breath, breathing in this love. as if imbibing the qualities of love with the air that comes in so naturally, effortlessly to your body, fills up your chest, fills up your heart, just allowing yourself to enjoy receiving this love And just being very patient, not forcing anything if you feel resistance or dullness or nothing in particular, that's absolutely fine. You're just inviting your mind to respond to this idea of allowing love into your body through your breath. And trusting the mind to respond in its own time. Just being breathed.
And if this is resourcing and nourishing for you, you can continue to work with just receiving this benevolent, loving breath. Or notice that when your breath leaves the body, it carries that same warmth. So if you are working with a person, a representative of loving kindness to you, you might wish to imagine receiving love from them and on the exhale, allowing that love to go back to them to suffuse them with your loving kindness so that love is shared. Or just going out into the world, into the nature, into your safe, inviting space. Breathing in a gift of nature, breathing out as your gift, back to her. Always feeling into any sensations around your chest, or wherever enjoyable sensations arise. See if you can open to those feelings of pleasure, or any feelings, agreeable or disagreeable, with that same sense of openness and warmth.
And now we're going to see if we can widen the sphere of our love, our metta. See if we can receive a little bit more. So tuning in, first of all, to the energy in this virtual Zoom space. All the wonderful beings from across the world who we're practicing with right now. Just allowing yourself to receive that warmth, that sense of safety, friendship, trust. And on your out breath, sharing those feelings with everyone here. Just breathing without any effort, without too much conceptualizing, just breathing in the energy that's here and letting it be shared. Filling up not only your chest, your belly, but filling up your whole body from head to toe. Perhaps expanding beyond your body, beyond any sense of this physical body. As the mind becomes wider, the love becomes more universal, spreading out. wherever it is you're living right now. Breathing in any goodwill that may be around you, the goodness of the people in your neighborhood. With every breath, sharing the energies of your life, your goodwill, your intention for peace, Sharing that with all those who live nearby. Imagining us all breathing collectively. Not only in our own town, but also in this country. Maybe England or Hong Kong, Croatia, Austria, America, wherever you are, breathing in benevolence, breathing out friendship, goodwill, love. And allowing the mind to encompass ever greater areas of this earth. The neighboring countries. Places further away, particularly maybe those places where there's great conflict, great pain. Imagine every breath of yours bringing peace. Suffusing all beings who are struggling right now, maybe afraid for their life. All beings who may be dying. Imagine your love flowing out to them. suffusing their breath with yours. So their last breath may be a breath of peace. And 
imagining this beautiful loving kindness spreading all across this beautiful planet Earth. suffusing all human beings and non-human beings with feelings of safety and love. All beings breathing wherever they may be. May they breathe with ease May they breathe in safety. May each breath be a precious reminder of this valuable yet fleeting life. May every breath that we take and that we take together. May every breath be breathed in kindfulness, awareness and kindness combined. Allowing these healing energies to flow out from your body through your breath to the world. Peace, with every breath, I'm going to share some words of loving kindness with you all. So just keep on breathing in the love, trusting the healing power of the practice of mindfulness, of kindness, and of the Buddha's words. Sabe Sata Sabe Pana Sabe Buddha Sabe Pogala Sabe Atta Bawa Pariapana Sabai Tio Sabe Poisa Sabe Aria Sabe Anavia Sabe Dewa Sabe Manusa Sabe Winiparika Awe Rahontu Abya Paja Hontu Ani Gahontu Sukiatanam Parihavlam Tu Dukha Munjantu Yadalada Sampadito Mawe Gajantu Kamasaka Sadhu. 
Sadu. Sadu. <laughs> it's very reassuring that I'm not the only one being silly with the sadhus. <laughs> it's nice to see you all join in. And, uh, yeah, unfortunately in the recording that's not very obvious. <laughs> But it's really a lovely way to end the meditation. So however it went for you or however you think it went, you can end with a smile. It doesn't really uh, bow to your judgment. <laughs> Every breath you take can be a, a breath of mindfulness and kindness. So yeah, it's always this gradual process. It's not about what you haven't been aware of, but it's about coming back in every moment and just adding that little bit of extra care. So I hope that was uh, another tool for the box. <laughs> it's not our usual way of practicing metta together. We often um, go through the different groups of beings. We sometimes use the phrases of may I be happy, may I be well. May you be happy, may you be well, may you be peaceful. So there's different ways and that can work for some occasions, for some people, some of the time. Uh, but adding that meta to the breath is another way. And uh, thank you for your comments, seeing that a couple of you uh, appreciated that. And uh, yeah, we still do have time for any comments, questions, or as your brown wife says, complaints. <laughs> But remember, you're only complaining to yourself, really, because we're all responsible for our own uh, for our own world, aren't we, in many, many ways, and uh, obviously for each other too, as much as we can care. So, uh, yeah, a chance someone's asking about that. Um, that is, I don't know if it really has a name, but it's, uh, if you can just Google Sabe Sata, like the word Sabesata, that's kind of how it starts. It's a Burmese chant, and there's different ones, um, different kind of ways of formatting the same phrases. You know, some add a little bit, some minus a little bit, but it's basically going through all the different categories of beings that exist, that breathe, that live, and saying, may they all be happy, may they all be free from enmity, may they all um, basically be liberated. So... It goes through the various groups just to make sure everyone's included, all men, all women, and that includes all gender non-binary beings, um, all people who are enlightened, all people who are not. Of course, the group that are not are much greater than those who are. Um, all living beings, all human beings, all non-human beings, visible, invisible, etc. So uh, all beings. And it's interesting that in the Pali language, the word for being is the same as the word for breath, pāna. Sabe sata means like uh, being, sabe pāna is the next sentence, which means all breathing beings. It's exactly the same thing. But the word pāna, ana pāna, right? Ana, in going, outgoing, breath, pāna, um, meant being. Because if we don't have a breath, I say a minute, two minutes, three minutes, we're, we're dead. I think it's about a couple of minutes, right, that we can survive without breathing. So every breath is very precious. Yes, it's very similar. Uh, someone's saying they're familiar with the Sabe Sata Suki Hon too. Yeah, it's very, very similar to that. This is the way my teacher in Burma used to chant. So every morning for four years... <laughs> Not every day I would listen, but most days they would queue up for the arms line in the early morning with a beautiful soft sun. It was soft at that hour, just, and then it became baking hot. <laughs> it felt very magical. Sometimes there was a mist and a ray of light coming through the mist and you couldn't quite understand. Sometimes the ray of light was coming not from the sun. It was extraordinary. I have photos that show this. It was a different direction the light was coming through. <laughs> because my teacher was very powerful he was one of the not so much worldly people and uh, when he chanted you could really feel it so he'd do that before setting off for arms two miles into the village barefoot even my mum and dad came to visit me there uh, a couple of times and my dad joined in one of the arms rounds and uh, you had to go barefoot and it's you know a little bit stony and 
Sometimes, in fact, one of the monks came back once with this terrible, like, cuts through his toes. He'd stood on a can. It was really quite awful. And um, there was a Burmese doctor there who didn't, I mean, the medical system's not the best. And he just poured meths on the foot. <laughs> the poor monk was, like, eating the pain, you can say, trying not to scream. But anyway, the um, monk ahead of my father, because he's obviously not a monk, he was walking at the back holding the bucket where the food would get tipped into. He was kicking out all the pebbles, anything that was sharp, so that my dad could walk safely because they recognise, you know, as Westerners, we're just not used to, to that, and his feet are rather tender. But that was the kind of kindness, you know, of those very humble, very simple monks and nuns <laughs> who lived in that monastery. But the Burmese people in particular, you know, just some of the kindest, most humble, beautiful people I've ever met anywhere. And I've said this many times, but as a woman also, it was a country I immediately felt safe to travel, to be alone as a woman. You know, the people would actually look after your stuff rather than sort of <laughs> threaten to steal or, you know, in some places you have to guard very closely your little traveller's checks or whatever. I think by then I didn't have any traveller's checks, but, you know, they'd actually say, give it to me, let me look after your stuff. Just beautiful. So thank you for your comments, but still feel free. There's two more minutes if anyone has a question or anything they're working with at the moment like to share. Um, seems you're all well and quiet and there'll be other opportunities too. Uh, so what's happening next? We'll go back to our Wednesday. I think Minori's been doing that in my absence, I'm guessing. Have you? Yeah, thank you so much. So on a Wednesday afternoon, 5.30 UK time, we have a uh, metta chanting session where we just chant the metta sutta. And it's an opportunity to dedicate the blessings of the Metta Sutta to whoever in your life, including yourself, might be struggling or in need of a bit of support. So it's lovely. I mean, usually only 10 or 12 people, sometimes more, come along to that. But it's a kind of group holding field and it's empowered by the Buddha's words. So even though you might think, oh, it's just chanting the Metta Sutta, within that half hour, invariably, people go from feeling a bit tired, a bit groggy, maybe sad, to feeling quite uplifted and bright. So some people join from different time zones and they join during their working hour or their lunch break or something. And it's like a really resourcing um, <clears throat> energy that they get from that. And then on, um, on the Friday evenings, we have our sutta discussion and uh, some Saturdays we have this meta meditation. Hopefully it'll be more often because tomorrow, tomorrow, Another bikini comes again to join me all the way from Perth. So Venerable Opeka will be back. Hopefully she'll get through immigration okay. Because <laughs> Aussies, they get a six-month visa, but you never know, right? They might ask lots of questions. Anyway, it's all fine. She's coming to stay with a friend, so <clears throat> she should be here tomorrow. So if I'm not here, she is. So I'm going to try and make sure she continues the sessions in my absence as well because I'm teaching overseas quite a lot this year. So have a look on our events page. We can always put the link in there. Um, any more links to share? Uh, maybe I should say just quickly before you all go that we are looking to expand our WhatsApp communities, especially the ones who are offering food. It's basically because bikunis don't tend to have a regular... Um, uh, regular visitors offering food on day. <clears throat> it's just not part of, you know, our society really and we don't tend to attract huge amounts of people from the traditional Buddhist communities because bhikkhuni ordination is something that still hasn't been accepted in the mainstream, sadly, sadly to say. So most days I don't have people coming to offer food. So this group is called, uh, uh, no, that's Hands at the Ready. Actually, it's... Um, yeah, well, it's the it's the food at the ready group that we're most keen for you to join. The hands at the ready works best for people who are local, to be honest, um, because it's kind of people I can draw on to give me a hand. <laughs> so at the ready means kind of when I really need it, or the sangha, let's say, really need it. Uh, and there's an afar group, which is food at the ready, anukampa food at the ready, um, which can also be done from afar. So wherever you are, you can order some shopping for us online and um, you can uh, 
we can receive the food and the lay guests can cook it for lunch. So a lot of the time it's the lay guests who stay here who, who cook the food. And once we move to the bigger monastery, we won't have a shop nearby. So we will want to set up kind of regular um, food offerings. And the nice thing about joining a group is that there's no onus on any one individual. You know, you're able to offer whatever you can when you can. And it's all anonymously done. So, and someone else asked about donating financially. That is also in the chat. So you just go to our website and there's ways to do it as a one-off and there's ways to do standing orders, even if it's just a couple of pounds a month. It's every little counts, every amount adds up. So it's never about the amount. It's whatever brings you joy that you feel um, is uh, a beautiful thing to do. So we thank you all for your support and especially your practice and I uh, hope to see you somewhere online or in person very soon.